Children's Bible time. There we go. That's a little better. We have some Bible time in here, all right? We're going to have some Bible time in here, all right? All right, there. Now we got it. We got to go tell on the mountain or whisper it in a well. There was a little ditty. I heard it years ago, and I thought, well, that, that bears repeating. It goes something like this. He who has a thing to sell and goes and whispers in a well is not as apt to make the dollars as he who climbs a tree and hollers. I like that, don't you? It's, it's a truth. You want somebody to know something, go and tell them. And if you really want somebody to know something, get next to somebody they're next to and whisper it to them. Because the only things we whisper are things that are valuable to be heard. But sometimes those things we whisper need to be shouted. At any rate, do we need to be telling people about Jesus Christ? There's no question about that. We all know that. We understand that truth. If you look at John's Gospel, first, uh, not 1 John, but the first chapter of John's Gospel, when John begins this Gospel, he begins telling us about Jesus this is what he says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. In other words, John's telling us about Jesus, and that Jesus was preeminent. Jesus was before time. Jesus is the Creator. When you read in Genesis that God created everything, how did He do it? He spoke it into existence. And John, the apostle, is confirming to us that Jesus, the Son of God, was in fact the Word that brought all things into existence. So John introduces us to Jesus, but John also introduces us to John the baptizer. This John writing the gospel is John the apostle, but John introduces us to John the baptizer. Why was he called the baptizer? Because he baptized people. Why did he baptize people? He baptized people in preparation for Christ's coming. That was his ministry. That was his work. That was his message that the Messiah is coming. If you drop down to verse 19 of, of John's Gospel, chapter 1, John chapter 1, verse 19, this is what John the Apostle says about John the baptizer. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews came to him, or when the Jews sent to him, Maybe I better put on my glasses first so I can read this. Oh, yes, there it is, black and white. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Now what they were asking him were very legitimate questions because they had seen in the prophetic word of God that the Christ was coming. Christ means Messiah. Uh, Christ is Greek. Messiah is Hebrew. Both words mean the anointed one of God. He was the one who would come and resolve all the issues of sin. I don't know if they understood it exactly like that, but they knew he was coming. They knew it was special. They'd been looking for him for over a thousand years. But they also knew about that prophecy that uh, Malachi had made that before the great notable day of the Lord when the Messiah would come, that Elijah the prophet would come first. Now, who was Elijah? He was that hairy, outspoken guy back in the old covenant. Well, who was John the Baptist? He was a hairy, outspoken guy. Came to introduce the new covenant. That's who John was. He came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And then there was this question in verse 21. Are you the prophet? Now, Moses had prophesied in Deuteronomy that, that God would send them a prophet like unto Moses, and they'd better listen to him because if they didn't listen to that prophet, it would be required of them. In other words, their lives would be forfeit if they didn't listen to the prophet that God was going to send. So they're asking John, are you this guy? Are, are you the Messiah? No, I'm not the Messiah. Are you Elijah? Well, actually, John was the one who fulfilled that prophecy, but John didn't know it. And so he said, no, I'm, I'm not Elijah. Are you the prophet? Well, no, I'm not that prophet. But John is saying, I came to bear witness of that prophet. Look what he says, verse 22. They said to him, Who are you so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And John said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. And when they uh, 
They had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. And these things took place in Bethany, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Quite a ways from Jerusalem, but not that far. Close enough so that, as Matthew records it, all of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to John to be baptized. So that's why the Jews, the leaders, were sending out priests and Levites. Go find out who this guy is. And so they came out there, because all Jerusalem and Judea is coming out there to be baptized by him. And they said, who are you? Are you the Christ? No, I'm not the Christ. Are you, are you Elijah? No, I'm not Elijah. Are you the prophet? No, I'm, I'm not the prophet. Well, who are you? I'm a voice of one crying in the wilderness. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Do you believe that that has any application to our situation today? I think about America, and on one hand, we are, of course, I believe the most prosperous nation in the world. Perhaps the most advanced nation in the world. I know that the technology comes from Japan, but who's got more of it than anybody else in the world? I think maybe we do. Now, I, I don't know about that for sure, but I know when it comes to military might, everybody, every country in the world looks to us. When the world looks for economic might, they still look to the United States. Everybody's looking to the United States. Spiritually speaking, however, spiritually speaking, are we moving more towards being a wilderness or more towards being a civilized people? See, when John says he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, I, I kind of liken that to us today. We are God's people. We are God's kingdom. And I don't say that to disparage anybody else in the world. I'm simply saying we know that's who we are. Do you know that's who you are? Do you know that's who you are? All right, I just want to make sure about that. Because John knew who he was. Now what he says here, and he's going to say it again, when he first saw Jesus, he didn't know him for who he was, because it hadn't been revealed to John who Jesus was. He didn't recognize him. Look down at verse 29. I'm sorry, uh, verse 31. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifest to Israel, I came baptizing in water. Verse 33. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. John did not realize who Jesus was until it was revealed to him who he was. He knew he was preparing the way for him, but he didn't know which man was going to fulfill this word of the Messiah. And then God showed him that it was Jesus. He's out in the wilderness preaching. I think in many ways we are out in the wilderness preaching today. Now, I don't want to go back to the 50s and 60s, do you? I mean, there were some wonderful things about the 50s and 60s, but I, I don't want to go back in time, and it's pointless to think about going back in time because it's just a, you can't do it. But were the people of this nation more open to the gospel in the 50s and 60s than, than they are now? What do you think? I think so. And I'm hearing a lot of the, the, the sort of rumbling, I think, from people who are old enough to have been back in the 50s and 60s. So they know that things have changed. So, since the gospel is perhaps less well received today than it was then, what should we do? Should we cease to be a voice crying in the wilderness? Or should we cry all the louder? This is a lesson about reaching out. When you think about reaching out, what, what's the imagery? Well, obviously, the, the imagery of reaching out is this. Now, if it's like this, what does that mean? It means give me something. But if you're reaching out to someone, the natural tendency is for them to reach back. Psychology is like that. God made us that way. When people reach out to you, we're designed to respond. And we might have to train ourselves not to respond. Oh, hold back. But naturally, we want to reach out. Somebody comes up to you and puts their hand out with a smile on their face, 
you want to reach out and shake their hand. You don't even know who they are, perhaps, but there's a guy who's smiling at me who reaches out to me, and I'm going to naturally reach out to him. As a matter of fact, it's, it, it's offensive and it's hurtful to kind of think, well, I'm, going to, I'm not going to shake that guy's hand. I don't know who he is. Well, who cares who he is? He's smiling at you and he's reaching out his hand. Natural response, natural instinct is reach out, greet him, find out who he is. That ought to be our spirit to the world, this wilderness in which we now live. It used to be that anybody you talked to believed in God. Anybody you talked to read the Bible. It used to pretty much be like that. It's not like that anymore. I don't like it. I'd rather it be a different way. I'd rather be able to address people in terms of Scripture with book, chapter, and verse and say, have you read this? And then be able to say, yeah, I have. I read my preacher was talking about the other day. But, but anymore, he used to talk about, uh, now, if you read in 1 Corinthians, they're going to say, what's the 1 Corinthians? Because people, by and large, are not as knowledgeable about the Scriptures today as they used to be. The Jews were looking for the Christ to come. It's not so much like that today. And yet... And yet, there's so many things we can learn about how to approach the world by reading what we have here in front of us in the New Testament. When John the Baptist saw Jesus approaching, twice he did this. Look at verse 29. John the Baptist said, The next day he saw Jesus coming to him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. What's he do? takes away the sin of the world. Now the Jews understood that. Do we understand that? The Lamb of God. Is he talking about? He's talking about sacrificial lamb. You kill that lamb and that blood of that lamb atones for blood. That was the way the law read. As a matter of fact, you can go back to Leviticus and you can read about the sacrifices. And when the blood has been shed by the priest, when they kill the animals, they're supposed to kill the animal, what it says over and over and over again is, it shall be forgiven him. It shall be forgiven him. Now, all of those forgivenesses based on animal blood were looking forward to the coming of the Son of God. The one who was God's Son. The one who was the perfect Lamb who would shed his blood. John was pointing people to Jesus. Now, if you stop and think about it, John's out in the wilderness preaching. We're talking about today being the wilderness. What was the end result of not only John's preaching, but Jesus' three years of ministry? What was the end result of it? There's different ways to look at it. What happened to Jesus? They crucified him. They crucified him. After hearing John preach about Jesus, after John the Baptist introducing them to Jesus, after Jesus ministering for three years. By the way, what kind of things did he do during the course of his ministry? Oh, things like giving the blind back their sight giving those who weren't able to hear back their ability to hear. He healed withered limbs. He took care of diseases that nobody else could take care of. Raised the dead. So after three years, they kill him. You talk about a wilderness. (laughs) You talk about a wilderness. That was it. Are things really any worse today than they've been in the past? I'm not so sure that they are. But I know the same answer applies today as it did 2,100 years ago, the same answer is Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He says it again in verses 35 and 36. Again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. He looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is translated means teacher, Where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you'll see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You're Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. So what happens? Well, Andrew meets Jesus. What does Andrew do? He goes and gets his brother. Why does he go get his brother? Because he cares about his brother. He's found something important. He's found the Messiah, the one they've been looking for. Well, I'm going to go get my brother. How many people does Andrew convert 
as we read about Andrew's converting work, preaching work, and ministering work in the rest of the New Testament. We don't read about that in the rest of the New Testament, do we? We don't say anything else about Andrew. But what did Andrew do? He went and got Peter. Well, what do we read about Peter? Wow. Peter was the one who preached that sermon on Pentecost, wasn't he? What if Andrew had said to himself, Oh, I don't want to bother Peter with this. He's my brother. We've got a pretty good relationship. If I tell him about the Messiah and he disagrees that Jesus is the Messiah, we might have a fight. We could lose our relationship. I don't think I'll tell him about that. But Andrew tells his brother. His brother becomes one of the most effective tools for God that mankind has ever known. When I read this, I have to wonder to myself, how many people are there out there that I'm not talking to that could be another Peter? I'm not as efficient and effective as I'd like to be. Well, well, what if I just was a little more efficient, a little more effective? What if the next person I approach with the gospel was someone who's going to be just like Peter, way outstrip any efforts that I've ever made for getting the gospel preached to the world? What if the next guy I talk to is that guy? What should I do? Better talk to him, shouldn't I? Even if it seems like the modern landscape is a wilderness, there's somebody out there I know it. You know it. We just need to talk. We need to tell people. We need to get the word out. We still need to tell them about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It goes on. If you see a little farther in this same chapter, it says the next day, verse 43, he purposed to go into Galilee and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. So what does Philip do? He goes and gets Nathanael. Do you see a pattern developing here? Somebody finds out about Jesus and the first thing they do is go find somebody else that they know and care about and tell them about Jesus. It's the same thing in chapter 4, only it's a little different in chapter 4. And we've, we've studied 4 before, we need to look at it again. I think we need to remind ourselves of the fourth chapter of John quite often. Verse 3, he left Judea, went away into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, where the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph was there. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour, about noon. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. You see what's happening here? Culture says, current wisdom says, if you're a Jew, you don't mess with Samaritans. If you're a Samaritan, you don't mess with Jews. There's a divide there. You know why Jesus came? He came to tear down all these divides. He came to tear down the walls that separate people, but especially he came to tear down the wall that separates us from God. And so he's talking to this woman. He addresses her first. He asks her for a drink. Jesus answered and said to her in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well's deep. Where do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us this well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst but the water that I will give him will be in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And she says to him, Give me this water, sir, so that I may not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. What's the next thing Jesus says to her? It sounds like, from, from my perspective as an amateur evangelist, he's got her in the palm of his hand. Why doesn't he teach her now what she needs to know? Well, that's exactly what he's about to do. What does he say to her next? Go call your husband. Why does he say that to her? 
because he knows her life. Sir, I have no husband. He said, oh, you've said well that you have no husband. You've had five, and the one you have not, or the one you have now is not your own. This you've said truly. Whoa. I want to see the hands of everybody, <laughs> not really, who's ready to go talk like this to people you know and love. Wow. Was he being ugly, mean, hateful? No. Trying to reach out to her the way she needed to be reached out to. Finally, this woman comes to the conclusion that this is the Christ. Well, what does she do? If you drop down to verse 28, it says, The woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? This is not the Messiah. Now, wait a minute. She's a Samaritan. Are they looking for the Christ? Yes, she is. They're looking for the Christ. She's saying, this is not the Christ, is it? The Jews were looking for the Christ. The Samaritans were looking for the Christ. Is anybody looking for the Christ today? I'm telling you, there are people out there looking for Jesus. They may not even realize it. But they're looking for Him. Somebody's got to be there for them. They went out of the city, it says in verse 30, and were coming to Him. And eventually, look what they say down in verse 39. Uh, from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all things that I've done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we've heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. In other words, they're testifying to her, what you said was the truth. We've heard it for our own ears. This is what we need to do. How much convincing did she need to do? I don't know everything she said. But what she did wind up doing was introducing these men to Jesus. And they took it from there and he took it from there. And things changed. There's a, there's a correlation to this in 1 John chapter 1. Uh, I asked Chuck to read that passage because, well, John begins this letter, first letter, much like he does his gospel, talking about Jesus being from the beginning, but, but see where he goes with it here. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Now, we don't use the word manifested very often. What does it mean? All it means is to make something clear, to make it plain, to make it uh, displayed openly so that everybody can see that it is what it is. That's what manifested means. It means I'm going to show you exactly what this is. And so John is saying that life was made clear to us made open to us, made plain to us, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made clear to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And then look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. This is where we need to be. This is where I need to be. This is where you need to be. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. What things are they writing? Things about Jesus. Is, is all they mean by this that we're just happy to write this down? Or is what they mean in the first three verses? We're declaring Jesus to you. He was made clear to us. We want to make Him clear to you. We've got fellowship in Him. We want you to have that same fellowship. Is that what this is about? We're writing this so that our joy can be made complete. How's their joy going to be made complete? When the fellowship they have with Christ is the fellowship that comes to be between these people and Christ. Tonight, 4 o'clock. We've been working on this for some time, the, the elders and we're going to kick it off tonight. It's a visitation program. One of the things that you know is happening, and one of the things that the survey that we recently took has shown us, is that sometimes things slip through the cracks. We don't ever want that to happen. And so we're, we're trying to, to make good and catch up with that so that 
Everything that needs to be taken care of is taken care of. This visitation program uh, is going to be started with 16, 16 couples. I always have the numbers right until I get up here. Four couples for every Sunday in a month. And so every Sunday, there'll be some couples going out to make visits. Now, so far, we've got some folks that have been selected to do this, that have agreed to do this, but it's not limited to just those folks. If you'd like to be part of this, we want you to be part of this. But this sermon is not just for this particular ministry that we're beginning tonight. It's because this is a mindset. It's the same kind of mindset we talked about this morning in Bible class of being zealous for personal ministry. It's the same kind of mindset we talked about last week when we talked about service, where Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. I didn't come to be ministered to, but I came to be a minister to others. That was Jesus' attitude, and when we become His disciples, we live out that same attitude. And so we're looking at what John had to write, because John was constantly preaching Jesus. He even talked about John the baptizer who preached Jesus. And he said, the reason we preach this Jesus is because we want our joy to be full. And I, I really convinced that what John was talking about is that what would fulfill his joy is for others to come into this same fellowship that we have in Christ. Brothers and sisters, is this building full enough for you? Do you see places in these pews that you'd like to be filled with people you know? Maybe family members, maybe neighbors, maybe co-workers, maybe fellow students. How is that thought ever going to become a reality? Unless we first say something to people who are lost. That's really what it comes down to. Talking to people who are lost. It can be scary, but the end result can be marvelous. I want to close with a passage in Proverbs, and I haven't completely figured this out. It's just a very brief passage, but I, I think it says something very profound that has a deep impact in, in these thoughts we're talking about today and reaching out to others. Proverbs chapter 27. It's just one verse. It's verse 5. You read this, you think about it, you tell me what you think about it, you tell me what you think it's talking about, and, and tell me if you think it has any application for what we're talking about this morning in reaching out to lost people with the gospel. This is what it says, Proverbs 27, verse 5. Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Now I could ask you as a as a Christian, as a member of the Lord's kingdom, what's the greatest way you could show your love to someone else? Is it not to tell them about Jesus? Now the thing about this is, if we don't get that done, we've concealed two loves. We've concealed our own love for that individual, and we've also concealed Jesus' love for them as far as they're concerned. On the other hand, if we talk to people about the Lord, if we do what we can to impress them with the truths of the gospel, if we do what we can, even as this passage puts it, to confront them. What did Jesus do with the lady in John chapter 4? He confronted her, didn't he? Go call your husband. Oh, I don't have a husband. Well, you've said right. You've had five. And the one you got now is not your own. Why did he say that? Because he loved her. It was an open rebuke, wasn't it? In a way. But it was a loving rebuke. Jesus did not conceal his love for her. We should not conceal our love for others. Amen? We're going to stand and sing a song of encouragement and invitation because there might be somebody here who does not yet know the kingdom, who does not yet know the love of God. It's a simple process. You put your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You confess His name before others. And let someone bury you in water. It's baptism. You're reenacting the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Simple plan. 
We'd like to help you do that if that's what you'd like to do this morning. We invite you to respond as we stand and sing the invitation song together. Jesus, I 